Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And this is a continuation of our prior show in which we kind of reviewed the definitions of radiation, um, you know, what the causes were, and that type of explanation today. I want to discuss the foods and supplements that aid and abed radiation protection and detox. Now, I know there's been a lot of concern about uh, Fukushima um, out of Japan, but on a regular basis, as we discussed in our prior show, we have radiation exposure, 300 x-rays for a mammogram, you know, that kind of stuff, dental x-rays, uh, we have radon exposure, we have it in basic scrap metal we're exposed to, um, radiation from the sun, radiation everywhere. <laughs> So what I've done is I've addressed the key researched items that I believe could be relatively protective and aid and abed the detox of radiation exposure, particularly for those people who are undergoing cancer therapy for radiation or those who are getting um, x-rays or a lot of CT scans. So when we look at foods to fight radiation, boy, we really got to look initially to the sea, and that would be a lot with the sea vegetables. There's a sea um, a, a vegetable called sodium analganate. Now, it comes from seaweeds, including wakame, kombu. You can actually buy a substance called agar uh, from a local health food stores or your local health food store. It actually can be used as a thickening agent that you can make jello with that is a sodium analganate based. But it literally reduces certain types of radioactive strontium 90 that really absorb uh, readily into the bone tissue. It can reduce the effects 50 to 83% of how much radiation is absorbed into the bone. So when you have these types of radiation exposures for mammograms or even where they're targeting pinpointing radiation, the potential for bone cancer rises substantially when you undergo treatment uh, with radiation for whatever cancers or if you're exposed in other ways as well. So a lot of research actually done um, by the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission on a lot of these things that I'm going to bring out to you. Good research. So, you know, when they say on, on the television that supplements don't have much research, well, apparently they're not looking at our own U.S. agencies and how much research that they conduct. Um, there's also kelp and dulce. Now, there's green um, marine algaes, there's red marine algaes, there's brown seaweeds. There's a lot of these different forms, and they all seem to uh, afford some sort of protection against radiation. Um, Dulce, for example, is a red marine algae that can really help protect the thyroid. Kelp is the same way because the iodine source uh, in it is found to be very protective of the thyroid. It's kind of funny. Table salt, you know, that we used to iodize, um, actually depletes iodine out of the body. So when they used to say, oh, we got this iodized salt leftovers from gun, uh, gun powder manufacturing, and it's got iodine in it. No, actually, that's a different kind of iodine. So that's not even a readily absorbable form. So you look to these forms. Now, there are other vegetables that do have iodine-rich foods in them, and, I, and I've mentioned um, them on, on the sheet. And that includes garlic and onions and spinach and kale and egg yolks and turnip greens and squash and mustard greens, cucumbers, asparagus, citrus, pineapple. There's a lot of things that contain iodine rich. They uptake it richly into their um, cells. If you notice, there's quite a bit of cruciferous vegetables on that listing as well too. They also contain iodine. So if you've got sea vegetables and good organic forms, now mind you, there are certain fertilizers that they utilize on this, tobacco, and other things that literally when the sun hits it becomes radioactive by its nature. So you're going to need to go with organically produced if you want the protective uh, availability of these uh, items against you know, radiation from the sun, radiation from dental x-rays, so on and so forth. Bee pollen. Now, this needs to be domestic and unsprayed bee pollen. That means unsprayed with pesticides. So your local bee pollen out of your local part, well, you know, regular warehouse isn't going to work. But it did give some protection against x-ray radiation. It helps with the, what we call the epithelial 
cells. And that's your expansive tissues in the cells. And there's a lining around cells that's really, really delicate. What this did is literally protect and help repair the damage done to these tissue cells. Now, in my research, I ran across a food I know that we use uh, even on our little uh, kelp that we, uh, or excuse me, our um, kale chips that we have that we dehydrate and spare enzymes at 118 degrees. But we throw on something called nutritional yeast. Now, it needs to be the right kind of nutritional yeast, and I've listed the form of yeast on there, uh, on the uh, nutritional yeast. That particular one is not a candida-based uh, type of yeast, but there are Russian studies that supported that if you utilize this particular form of yeast, it could increase survival by 90% increasing uh, due to radiation exposure from all forms of radiation. So when you look at things, all these little good yeasts, these good bacteria, these, these elements, you know, as Ralph has mentioned before, uh, we're over 90% bacteria. So there are certain yeasts and bacteria that are very protective against uh, diseases, radiation, and other exposures. Vitamin D and E. There was um, studies done on mice fetuses, and they literally found that uh, vitamin D and E protected fetuses from radiation. In addition, uh, radiation can cause a lot of damage to um, the blood, so hence leading to leukemia and other types of issues. Um, it actually prevented blood damage caused by radiation. Now, when we look at cellular phones, there's tons of electromagnetic blood damage that's occurring when you're on your cell phone or you're holding the cell phone. And remember, your blood circulates through your body. So um, vitamin D and E seem to be very protective in this nature. Now, um, I misspelled it, but calcium citrate or calcium lactate decrease the absorption of radioactive strontium-90 and calcium-45 uh, radiation the Veterans Administration of the United States of America did studies with a combination of, uh, I believe it was uh, calcium citrate and magnesium citrate, and they found that it reduced significant amounts of radioactive strontium from the blood. Very, very uh, good, important research. And all this research I'm giving you is all mostly, once again, government studies that have been done by us, the Russians, but valid good studies. Uh, selenium, when you're selenium deficient, if you're not eating a lot of good vegetables, Brazil nuts, things like that, your rate of radiation mortality rises significantly. Selenium helped reduce that. Potassium, boy, over 90% of Americans are potassium deficient. Now, when you have adequate amounts of potassium, and it comes from primarily your vegetables, and you got to eat a lot of them, six to 10 servings of vegetables a day to get most of these potassium levels. And bananas are 74th on the list, so that doesn't cut it. The body requires 4,700 milligrams of potassium per day. So potassium in a citrate form decreases cesium-134 and 137. Now, the 137 was what we saw at Chernobyl. Potassium actually binds and blocks the entry of cesium-137 into the body. It's phenomenally important that you have adequate amounts of potassium. So if you're on diuretics and you're undergoing any radiation therapy, oh boy, and I probably should ever use, use another word because that puts you in a real uh, dilemma as far as the potential for radiation damage that can cause to the body. Zinc, there was a, a man, especially zinc DTPA, and there was a man called the Atomic Man because he got exposed to this type of a radiation called americium 241 Now, it's 50 times stronger than plutonium-239 that everybody gets really scared with when our satellites fall out of, uh, back to the Earth. They gave him this form of zinc. Now, this man was not expected to survive because he had had the largest lethal dose at any of our atomic facilities. He survived and thrived. So lots, once again, of radiation uh, protection given for some of our atomic workers who should always be keeping their minerals very high. Now, when you run across studies, 
Boy, I'll tell you, the Russians, they really do study things. And there were over a thousand studies done on Siberian ginseng, a good portion of them on the ability to protect against radiation exposure. So uh, Siberian ginseng was given both as a protective for atomic workers as well as people doing cleanup, as well as uh, something post when an exposure occurred. And the survival rate just increased sub substantially with the utilization of Siberian ginseng. Aloe vera, when you have a radiation burn from you know pinpoint radiation, I'll tell you, I had one of my customers, lovely lady, Muriel, had so much radiation burning from radiation uh, given for breast cancer therapy, and she used that aloe, and that healed her and soothed her so well. And uh, wonderful, wonderful way to heal and actually topical application protect against some of radiation damage as well too. But we use it a lot with radiation burns. There's a lot of other things that I could go into. Lecithin, N-acetylcysteine, pectins, all those kinds of things are very protective uh, that uh, can be very helpful as well too in that regard. Now, I also want to mention from a protection standpoint, beta-1,3 glucon. Now, beta-1,3 glucon is a, uh, it comes from the cell walls of baker's yeast, but it's found a lot in uh, mushrooms as well, too. Very protective against radiation and very much researched by the military. Phenomenal protectant for preventative and actually a great cancer fighter. Vitamin A, natural beta carotene sources, very helpful radiation protection. When you're vitamin A deficient as well, too, you, your immune system drops substantially. B vitamins, German studies, literally on B vitamins, it helped give protection against lethal dosages of radiation. Vitamin C with bioflavonoids, the Atomic Energy Commission literally increased the survival rate, mind you, to 90%, I should have said, not just by 90%. Phenomenal uh, ways that we can protect ourselves against radiation exposure. If you listen to most of this, you're doing your vegetables, seaweed types of things, things rich in chlorophyll, spirulina, chlorella, all your vegetables that are leafy greens. You're talking about a good multiple high in bees, lots of sea with bioflavonoids, a great mineral supplement, you know, making sure your essential fatty acids are high. Um, essential fatty acids, um, literally, I think I mentioned on that earlier, protected mice from radiation exposure. Most people do not get good olive oils. They don't get good flax oil. They don't eat a lot of nuts and avocados and things. So the things I'm talking about are the very basics. You don't even have to go out and buy a whole lot of extra things. These are all things that do other things as well. So good multiple high in bees, C, your minerals, essential fatty acids, superfood greens, and you get a, get a heck of a lot of protection against radiation and a lot of other things as well, too. I hope that's helpful. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And on this, we usually give you a little bit of a healthy tip to help with fitness or with stress or anxiety, something physically uh, helpful. And today I want to give a tip to help you with a little bit of migraine relief or stress relief, uh, two exercises. And basically, they have some good neuro neurology support, neurologist research support backing them to help with uh, stress headaches. So what you do is you put your hands behind. Now, you know you have, you have that gap and you got a section of tendon and ligaments that go right behind the head? Well, I want you to kind of hold that and massage those tendon and ligaments that go right up to the brain and the head. I mean, just a nice little gentle circular massage. You know, you'll probably see sometimes you'll get massage therapists that go like that on the back of that area and they massage it. But you can massage it yourself just by grabbing the back of that, and that just feels so good. Now, next exercise takes your body out of, your brain out of that fight or flow, flight limbic brain 
into a more frontal lobe brain, which helps you focus and be able to think clearly. So what you do, thumbs go on the temples, that indented portion of the side of the head. Fingers go across the top of the brain, and you massage the temples and back and forth on the top of the forehead and while you're circulating your thumbs on the temples. And do that, I would say, probably for a good minute. You know, keep the eyes closed because we're trying to keep stimulation from outside uh, environment coming in. And then so hopefully that will switch your brainwave pattern more or you switch your pattern of thoughts more from that fight or flight stress into more of that reasoning ability in the frontal lobe. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Turciano. And thank you for that intro. Now at a headline called, Can Vitamin C Ward Off Your Risk of Stroke? Obviously, it's a leading question because it's been shown to do that. In the proceedings of the American Academy of Neurology's 66th Annual Meeting coming up in the future, April 26, 2014, I don't know why they released it so early, they discovered that vitamin C does play a huge role in hemorrhagic stroke, which is obvious because when you're deficient in it, that's what happens. And therefore, a lot of doctors will often confuse severe vitamin C deficiency with Ebola, which is also causes you know, people to hemorrhage. So let's look at it from this aspect. And they discovered was this. On average, the people that had strokes were vitamin C deficient. The people that did not have strokes hit adequate levels of vitamin C, which is curious because 59% of the people in their study were deficient or severely deficient in vitamin C, which, come on people, pirates had a better understanding of nutrition in the 16th and 17th century than the average public does today. So get on board, eat a little bit of citrus, fruits, vegetables, whatever it is. If not certain, you may want to talk or supplement with vitamin C. It's not going to hurt. It could only help. And to conclude, they said basically our, show, our results show that vitamin C deficiency should be now considered a risk factor for severe types of stroke as high blood pressure, drinking alcohol, and being overweight. So that means when you go to the doctor, not only do they want to test your cholesterol, your blood pressure, so on and so forth, they have to determine your vitamin C levels. Now the easy part about this, you don't have to take a drug to correct the deficiencies of vitamin C. You just take vitamin C. And they said too, vitamin C has been linked to heart disease. Obviously, if you can leave you prone to stroke, then it's gonna make a difference there. And that also vitamin C has other benefits, like creating collagen. For you smokers out there that don't want to look like you're prematurely aging, remember each cigarette depletes about 25 milligrams of vitamin C from the body. Vitamin C can help to offset that, even though stopping smoking would be better. And protein found bone, skin, and tissue, because vitamin C plays a role in bone density, skin quality, as we just discussed, and basically reduction of inflammation. Again, journal. I should say and apologize. American Academy of Neurology 66th Annual Meeting coming up this April 26, 2014 for footnotes. Now we go back to mammograms. Mammograms. So what exactly is the problem again? Well, the Canadians did research over 25 years. Now here's the catch. The Canadians did a study, and this is published in the British Medical Journal, they didn't do a meta-analysis. You know, a meta-analysis where you pick and choose your studies, you don't actually really do a study. You, you try to bleed off the hard work of other people, and you choose the ones you like, and you choose the ones you don't like. Well, the Canadians did actually a study study over 25 years involving 89,000 participants between the ages of 45 and 59. What they did is they had a control group and a mammogram group. Now, the mammogram group got a mammogram about every year. The control group just went through physical examinations. Guess who won? Well, let's look at the data. 
They said, the study showed, well, this is what they said. I'm not, not going to prelude it. Let's back up. Regular mammography screening is done to reduce mortality from breast cancer. Women with small non-palatable breast cancer detected by screening have a long-term, have better long-term survival than women with palpable breast cancer, da da da. But it's not clear whether this survival difference is the consequence of organized screening or of lead time bias, meaning the earlier you detect it, the more like the more you're going to catch. When testing increases perceived survival time without affecting the course of the disease and overdiagnosis. Overdiagnosis meaning you cure cancers that don't exist and you make yourself look good. So researchers based in Toronto, Canada, decided to compare the breast cancer. Obviously, we discussed made 9,000 people over 25 years. Long study. And during this 25-year study period, 3,250 women in the mammography arm and 3,132 women in the control arm. Remember the control arm being no mammography, just physical examination. Were diagnosed with breast cancer. And 500 and 505 died respectively. So not much difference, statistically, not much of a difference in death toll at all. Thus, the cumulative mortality from breast cancer was similar between the women in the mammography arm and the control arm. Now, here's the catch. The mammography had also, besides being totally ineffective from the physical arm, our physical diagnosis or physically checking yourself, I had a 22% overdiagnosis rate. Now, keep in mind, overdiagnosis means you are diagnosed with cancer and you're being treated for cancer that does not exist. Not just a mistake will call you in the morning and say, oops, we misdiagnosed you. This means you got it. You, they say you have it, and they're treating you regardless. So that has a whole other slew of problems to go along with it. They said at the end of the five-year screening period, they looked at 142 breast cancers occurred in the mammography arm compared with the control arm, 145 to excess. And if it's in 15 years, there's 106 excess. One overdiagnosed breast cancer for every 424 women who received mammography screening in trial. Now keep that in mind. That doesn't mean one misdiagnosed for every 424 diagnosed with cancer. That's one person misdiagnosed for every 424, I mean, just checked, period. And they said, unquote, they concluded the annual mammography, this is the researchers, not me at living does not result in reduction of breast cancer-specific mortality for women aged 40 to 59. Beyond that, a physical examination alone or usual care in the community. Now, here is the interesting caveat they came up with. They agreed with the study authors, the other doctors, that rationale for screening by mammography be urgently reassessed by policymakers. But point out, this is not an easy task because governments, Research funders, scientists, and medical practitioners may have vested interests in continuing activities that are well-established. Now, when you look at medicine, you always look to risk-to-benefit ratio. But you think that risk-to-benefit ratio only involves you. You never think to take into account that risk-to-benefit ratio may actually include other people's bank accounts, savings, or other monetary investments which they yield from you doing an ineffective diagnostic routine. So that's something to think about. Well, you kind of want to not stop checking the screening, but come on, mammography has been around since what? Past 50, 60 years. It came around like the late 1950s. And is, wouldn't you consider it an incredible disservice to women that you're dealing with a technology that's over a half a century old and they've come up with nothing better since then? like thermogram, sonogram, or anything along those lines, MRI. But no, as long as you're buying it, they're going to keep on selling it to you. And keep in mind, it's not bad to question mammographies. Your doctor's okay if he does do it. You know, if I take a, a stretch, I want to say, for example, quote, let's say Voltaire or Adlibum, you only can tell who your oppressors are by the ones where you have to pay a price for questioning or criticizing. Doctors are afraid to question the mammography thing. They've got to get over it, stand together, and look for better diagnostic materials. Because if it doesn't work, why are you doing it? Why are you paying for it? Why is it even there? And so something to think about. Now, 
This is pretty good for places that have what's called the norovirus. Take note, China, let's get a nor little virus, norovirus epidemic going on right now. In an article titled, Could Pizza Herb Prevent Winter Vomiting Disease? Which sounds really gross. Well, vomiting disease is also known as norovirus. Now, what I think discovered was this. Oregano it contains a component called Covercol. And Covercol has the unique ability to basically destroy the protein coating around the cells, or they show the virus, I have to take that back, called the capsid. Now, a lot of antibiotics and things like that cannot do that, including what they also discovered too, is the fact that oregano, or I should say the norovirus, doesn't seem to be able to build or develop an immunity or resistance to oregano, where it can do it with other antibiotics. And this came out of the Journal of Applied Microbiology, or I should say Society for Applied Microbiology's Journal of Applied Microbiology. And they said this, their words, the substance in oregano that gives the pizza herb its distinctive warm aromatic smell and flavor is effective against norovirus causing the breakdown of the virus through the outer coat. So it's good in combination too, if they want to do it with like an antibiotic, so what they're claiming. Norovirus is well known as the winter vomiting disease is a leading cause of vomiting and diarrhea around the world. Currently, right now, you have an outbreak in China, for example. In the experiments, Carvacol appeared to act directly on the virus capsid, the protein outer layer, a tough layer of proteins that surround the virus, causing it to break down. This would give another antimicrobial uh, the opportunity to enter the internal part of the virus and kill it. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to combine the Carvacol from oregano with something else that can kill a virus. Using the oregano is basically like a block to basically disarm the virus from developing resistance. So if Carvacol is used as a sanitizer, for example, in furniture, it is likely to be in conjunction with other antimicrobials. Ah, forget it, you know what I mean. And because it is slower acting in many disinfectants, such as bleach, it would be best used as a part of a routine cleaning regime to provide long-lasting antimicrobial residues on surfaces. Now what they're talking about too, is besides just taking it internally in a capsule form or liquid form, is you can take a drop or two and add it to your disinfectant. And therefore, without making the place smell too much like oregano, it can make that disinfectant work so much more effectively. And the second part is too, they also say that the oregano is long lasting. So once it's on the surface, it's there for a while. So work in perfect, perfect combination with it. Again, the Carver call from oregano, you buy oregano a capsule, make sure it's sanitized for Carver call, ideally about 70%. And thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. Once again, we appreciate you joining our show. Do your research. Thank you again.